Well, we are going to keep the movement moving forward as we were talking about Kamala Harris, who, of course, is now, well, I guess soon to be, perhaps, uh, I think I can predict that, the Democratic nominee for the President of the United States. There's a lot of different elements from Gaza to climate change to inflation to all sorts of policies that are going to be under the microscope vis-a-vis how she is going to respond and to talk a little bit about this initial uh, rollout, if you will, of Kamala 2024. We are very, very honored to be joined here on the show by Brianna Joy Gray, who, among other superlatives, is the host of the Bad Faith Podcast. Brianna, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Well, it's great to have you here. Uh, you know, I mean, maybe I'll just start a little bit with where we left off with our last guest, which is on Gaza. Uh, you know, it almost is as if I don't know if you felt this that the switch to Kamala Harris as the candidate in the mainstream media, at least they've almost presented it as if the anger around the genocide in Gaza will just disappear now and everyone will vote for her. I mean, does that seem like wishful thinking to you? Is this still going to be an issue for her in terms of, you know, her ability to appeal to people across country? I mean, it's deeply wishful thinking. And I have been very frustrated watching the online left at very least, and I know that's not representative of actual people in the world entirely, but the online left who have been, frankly, so passionate and so committed to the issue of Gaza and ending the war and ending the genocide, kind of flip on a dime and give Kamala Harris altogether too much credit, talking about being coconut pilled and how excited they are to, quote unquote, give her a chance to demonstrate that she can be to Biden's left on this. And it's confusing because we have seen for months, Kamala being weaponized um, in exactly that way as part of the Biden administration. Remember when she was trotted out to kind of soft launch the idea that the administration could use the word ceasefire, um, the administration ended up having to walk back even those kind of tepid statements that she made when, where, of course, she did not call for a meaningful ceasefire, meaning a permanent and enduring ceasefire. She just used the word as though that was going to trick us into believing that what the administration support supported was an actual end to this genocide. And without any evidence whatsoever that she was going to distinguish herself from Biden on that issue, a lot of people said, OK, let's give her a bit of a doubt. Um, Trump is really bad. Fascism, fascism is coming. We got to support her. Now, today, I'm not sure if you talked on, about this on the show already, Eugene, but she issued this statement in response to the protest happening in D.C. against Benjamin Netanyahu's uh, statement addressed to the uh, Joint Congress. And it really demonstrates that there is no air between Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. And I'm happy to get into it in more detail if you haven't already talked about it um, on the show. But it, it's really, frankly, disappointing. Well, I think we should get into it because I think people, you know, are, are maybe confused about this. And, and I, I did see the statement. We haven't talked about it yet. But yeah, I mean, it really just seemed like a, a carbon copy of what we've seen from Biden, not just in terms of the substance of the policy, but also just the approach to the idea of protest and mass movements. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't know if you're if you'll uh, bear with me when I read just a little bit of it. It's not that long. Um, But she says, yesterday at Union Station in Washington, D.C., we saw despicable acts by unpatriotic protesters and dangerous hate-fueled rhetoric. I condemn any individuals associating with the brutal terrorist organization Hamas, which has vowed to annihilate the state of Israel and kill Jews. Pro-Hamas graffiti and rhetoric is abhorrent, and we must not tolerate it in our nation. I condemn the burning of the American flag. That flag is a symbol of our highest ideals as a nation and represents the promise of America. It should never be desecrated in that way. And then wraps by saying, I support the right to peacefully protest, but let's be clear, anti-Semitism, hate, and violence of any kind have no place in our nation. And of course, as I'm sure you're aware and have covered extensively, so many of the protesters were themselves Jewish. And of course, they are not supporting terrorism. They are objecting to the terrorism that has been inflicted on the people of Palestine for the last 10 months slash 75 years. Well, you know, I think it opens up maybe the other main question, at least amongst people on, you know, the progressive side of the ledger here in the United States is, you know, with this sort of candidate in and candidate out element of the Democratic Party where, you know, there's some, you know, genuflection towards progressive ideas, progressive causes in the context of the campaign. But the basic statement is, if you want to see any of these policies too bad, too sad, you have to moderate, you have to, you know, curtail your ambitions. If in this context, okay, people... Biden is now gone. There's some energy coming around Kamala Harris, of course, 
from Democratic partisans. But I think the question still remains the same. If people are concerned about the direction of the country, it's moving too far in the right, too much in an anti-working class direction, too many other challenges, not addressing climate change or whatever, um, how do we actually stop this? And do does representing for just a, a more enthusiastic version of the same program uh, really set us on the course to turn things around here? Yeah, I think Kamala Harris is dangerous in the exact same way that Barack Obama was dangerous in so far as he put um, a a black face on a fundamentally corporate agenda and the Democratic Party's strategy for so many years as it has become increasingly, increasingly anti-labor and uh, aligned with the same interest groups that have historically funded the Republican Party, that the way it distinguishes itself is through identity politics. And of course, the fundamental harms that are just suffered disproportionately by identity politics aren't the issue. It's the weaponization of identity to uh, paper over the extent to which their agenda is no different from the corporate agenda that we see on the right side of the aisle. So seeing the memification of Kamala Harris, look, I'm not, you know, a scold. I'm not humorless. I see the memes and some of them are funny, you know, and I, on an emotional human level, understand why there was a sense of relief because so many people, even who loathe Joe Biden, have been white knuckling it, watching him struggle through speeches and just wondering how the Democratic Party could have sunk so low as to tie the collective fate of the country and, quote unquote, defeating Trump and, quote unquote, saving democracy to a man that was so obviously unprepared to beat Trump. Um, I understand the relief. I really do. But I, I guess I expected more discretion. Um, I expected more um, circumspicion from leftists who understand how these power dynamics work. I mean, it was just reported that uh, among the enormous campaign donations she got, one was from one particular billionaire in a $7 million quantity. And he immediately went on the news shows, on the, on the cable news shows, and started demanding Kamala Harris fire Lena Khan, one of the only bright spots of uh, um, uh, Joe Biden's uh, administration. And that's exactly the play for play, play for play that we understand works. It's why so many of us were supportive of the Bernie Sanders campaign, which set records for small dollar donations and rejected all billionaire funding. And frankly, it is, it's, it's disheartening. It's disappointing to see how because of a few, I don't know, brat memes and coconut pill memes and context memes, so many people were willing to give Kamala Harris the benefit of the doubt over the past few days. I am hopeful now that following this statement, following uh, a statement also from her husband, Doug Imhoff, where he says in so many words that there will be no flagging in America's commitment to to Israel and enabling it to quote unquote defend itself, um, that Kamala is simply the same policy in a different package. You know, I saw a tweet the other day, uh, you know, about some of the early things that have happened with Kamala and the, some of the calls and the organizing that was going on or quote unquote organizing, I guess you could call it. But I thought the tweet was poignant because it said tens of thousands of people getting on a call to talk about how to organize to help Kamala unconditionally while skipping over talking about how to organize around priorities to leverage on her. And, and it, it made me think of something that I think you've been really laser focused on, you know, as it concerns how progressives move things forward, which is if you have leverage, you have to use it. And, and it just feels like this is another moment where we're seeing that kind of this kind of capitulation as logic almost seep into the, the minds of so many people who, you know, I think ostensibly want things to get better in the country, um, but, you know, have no instinctual understanding of the, the the way power politics is and can be played. Yeah, my feeling personally is that after seeing the Bernie runs, to be honest, kind of representing the best possible scenario for the left, being able to work within the Democratic Party, uh, be so openly thwarted by the Democratic establishment, seeing them work harder against Bernie Sanders than they ever have against Donald Trump, made me confident that there's no path there and makes me believe that the most productive investment is in growing third parties, um, growing labor participation and the like. However, even if you are not where I am and you think that it is important to um, the most important priority is not the genocide or any other thing, but to just to simply stop Trump from being reelected in 2025 and the like, then you have to be able to understand the choice to use your leverage and not immediately pledge your vote unconditionally to Kamala Harris as part of an effort to make it more likely for her to win. She issues a statement like that and immediately 
you know, based, you know, this is a Twitter poll. It's not real, right? But thousands and thousands of people, at least on my timeline, who seem to be very open to Kamala Harris and were hopeful that she would represent a sea change on Gaza have immediately been tweeting, never mind, um, I'm never going to vote for her. I'm back, I'm back to the position that I was before. She's losing her base. She's losing a potential constituency. Democrats are flailing um, with young voters. Trump, um, it has higher numbers with young voters than the Democratic candidate. That's outrageous. I mean, that's like unprecedented. And um, uh, falling off terribly with Black voters, Latino voters, and all of these other constituency groups that are really core to the success of the Democratic Party. If you do want Kamala Harris to win, you are not doing her any favors by saying, yeah, she can beat me like a whipping boy and I'm not going to say anything about it because there's too many people who are uncompromising. What you need to do is realize or help her to realize that there is a bigger base of people who are willing to come out and vote and actually support her if she actually supports majoritarian populist priorities that include the majority of Americans wanting there to be an end to the genocide in Gaza. Well, you know, in a way, I kind of want you to double down on that because it reminds me of 2020. And, you know, you were there at the high levels of the Bernie Sanders campaign. And I remember the first debate and the infamous moment where, you know, they go after Bernie for universal health care and they say, who else is for eliminating all private insurance policy, uh, policies and her hand shoots up and she gives this defense of universal health care. And I'm watching thinking like, oh wow, Kamala's trying to steal Bernie's lane. Like this could be interesting. And then the second the debate was over, they started walking it back and it was like her, her campaign plummeted and it never, never resuscitated. But it was interesting to see how lifting up universal health care for that like 45 minutes of the rest of the debate, you know, all of a sudden raised excitement and interest about her well beyond what she had going into the debate. And by the next day, what she had when she had walked it all back. Yeah, that was a scary moment, frankly, for us, the campaign, because it wasn't just Kamala's um, <clears throat> campaign. It was also, I think, Elizabeth Warren's, where this argument was out there, <clears throat> excuse me, in the legacy media that hated Bernie, that what's the point of Bernie if you can get a woman version or a black and Indian version or a, you know, um, Pete Buttigieg, a, a gay version, right? A younger version. Like these were all arguments that were being bandied around. And it took basically all of those campaigns sort of self-destructing in that, in those ways, walking back their progressive promises over the course of the summer and early fall before Bernie finally moved into the number two spot, if you recall correctly. And Kamala Harris has had a series of moments, not just in that campaign, but also as a vice president, where she has gone too far and had to walk it back. And you can read that two ways, right? It might really be possible that her instincts are more on the progressive side. But the fact that she is forced to walk it back or chooses to walk it back, however you want to read that, the second that she's off stage and no longer alone and has her handlers around her, tells you exactly who is influencing her and what kind of president she's going to be. She's largely going to inherit uh, the Joe Biden administration. She There is talk of, again, like I mentioned, Lena Khan being fired, her um, brother-in-law, Tony West, who is the legal counsel for Uber. Um, the left was deeply involved and con concerned with the Proposition 22 uh, ballot measure in California a few years ago, where Uber was fighting to prevent Uber drivers from being able to be employees as opposed to contractors. I mean, these are the kind of people that she surrounds herself with and who are being floated as part of her administration. So I'm just, I would really implore the left to not forget the lessons that we understood about how power works in Washington. Bernie, the trust we had in Bernie, and I understand all of the disappointments that we have in him now, and I, I share them as anyone who follows me on Twitter or elsewhere knows. But the trust wasn't just out of nowhere. It came from a 40-year record of taking hard votes on hard issues, but also the fact that he was genuinely independently funded. And when people are championing these enormous sums that Kamala has been able to fundraise in the last you know, 48 hours or so, I think there should be a lot more scrutiny as to who is donating and what they expect in return. You know, I think one other important point and, and maybe also an important contrast to 2020 and then the tenor and the tone of the campaign that year is her own history as a prosecutor. And so, you know, before we let you go here, I wanted to touch on this because obviously she's leaning into this now. I've seen you know, some of her supporters saying, you know, she's the prosecutor, he's the convict in November, we're all the jury. And, you know, obviously we're in this backlash moment 
from what we saw in 2020, what we saw in Ferguson and Baltimore, the issue of changing the criminal justice system. Uh, and, and I guess it feels almost like a lot of people are looking at this as another issue of, well, that was in the past, that was a long time ago. Um, you know, but should we still really actually be focusing in on this element of her record, which I think speaks so heavily to the African-American community, which allegedly she's supposed to be representing? Yeah, I mean, I think this should have been an issue. And I know that I wrote about it back at The Intercept during her, um, after she'd launched her primary run and before I went left to work on Bernie um, and talked about it at length uh, once she was picked as the VP candidate because I couldn't believe it, frankly. We were in the middle of the summer of 2020. There seemed to be some indication that there was sensitivity in the Biden administration as to who he was going to pick because Amy uh, Klobuchar allegedly was not the VP precisely because she had been a prosecutor in um, uh, Minnesota who had let... um, one of the perpetrators of what was it, Derek Chauvin off in a, for a previous uh, infarction. Uh, and so it did seem like there was at least some self-awareness um, that in a Black Lives Matter moment, you couldn't pick a literal cop, right? A, a prosecutor. And then Kamala seemed to get a pass, I think, largely because of her race. And it's very similar to the trajectory she's had for an entire career. When she won her first DA race in San Francisco, she beat a progressive prosecutor, I believe his name is um, Tom Hanalan, who was white, but progressive. And Kamala ran against him with a tough on crime message. Uh, Back at The Intercept, Lee Fong actually wrote a piece where he went to the archives in uh, San Francisco to the library and was able to find the flyers that she was distributing at the time. And it's all um, like Willie Horton ad stuff with chalk outlines and, you know, uh, Latino torsos with gang uh, symbols uh, tattooed on them with guns saying enough is enough and literally hitting Hanalan on his uh, record because he had not locked up enough people, really using the kind of right-wing talking points that are very familiar as we're talking about Chesa Bowen and our, our, our other kinds of um, uh, Larry Krasner, progressive prosecutors today, and the flack that they get from the right. That was Kamala Harris. So this idea that those of us who are pointing that out are unfairly maligning her as a cop. No, she described herself as a top cop. I'm old enough to remember back in 2019 when people were horrified by that clip of her walking around saying um, mockingly, more schools, not jails, more schools, not jails, as though that's not exactly what she, we should be doing, is having more support for education and other kinds of social supports, as opposed to fueling the mass incarceration machine. And in fact, I just spoke with uh, Alec Katsanis on my own podcast, Bad Faith Today, about her prosecutorial record, um, and also about uh, this recent piece that he has written uh about how body cameras are an enormous uh, scam that was sold to progressives as a method to uh, limit police violence, which they don't in fact do. And I think we all need to take lessons from the mistakes that have been made and the trust that we've put in various interventions and understand that the propaganda is so deep and so strong. And we have to get more disciplined and more clear-eyed about who we're throwing our support behind, because I do agree that we are at a tipping point, not the same tipping point that liberals kind of hand ring about um, on mainstream news with, you know, Donald Trump and the end of democracy. But I do think that a window is opening here because of the historic unpopularity of these candidates. And it's a really important moment to be looking at third party alternatives and radicalizing people against the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Well, Brianna Joy Gray, as always, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you about all the things going on in the political world and elsewhere. You are the host of the Bad Faith Podcast, which I hope everyone is checking out. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time here on the Freedom Side. It's my pleasure. Thanks, Eugene.